Yeah, we they are. Uh, yeah, I'm John Strezabasco. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I'm here to discuss um, uh, my book, Nine Feet Under, What Poverty Does to People. Um, um, Want to start do, right now, John? I think uh, are we just presentations. Sure. Okay. I, yes. Okay, it's I, are, fine. Is it time? Uh, yeah, let's give just another right. minute or so, just a couple minutes, and I'll just do a quick intro of you but you um you know can intro um that's and, good yeah sure yeah oops, on my iPad. yeah i I'm think sure. it's yeah i know i don't like to keep people i sometimes give them a couple extra minutes but then you know people you know, if people are prompt you don't like to have them um wait too long either so, so yeah wait another minute or so yeah okay thank you Okay, I guess we can. Okay, how do I? Okay. Good evening, everyone. And I'm Peggy O'Neill, the Adult Services Programming Librarian here uh -huh. at Enfield Public Library. And I'd like to uh, welcome you all to our program tonight uh, 90 Feet Under What Poverty Does to People by John Strazabosco. Uh, John has written um, a book that the library has. Um, right now it is out, so um, people would have to reserve it. And uh, John has been a mathematics teacher and uh, has done uh, research in this area that he uh, is going to talk about. So without further ado, John, I'll let you take it over there. And we did ask people probably if you keep yourself muted, unless maybe at the time of questions, but we'll have it uh, put in the chat. The program is also being recorded. So if you wanted to see it again after, it'll probably be uploaded um, about two weeks after. So okay. I'll let you start now, Jen. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Peggy. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I'll tell you a little more about myself. Uh, I was a math teacher in the Pittsburgh School District for 33 years. Then I retired, and uh, I got into. I decided after a few years uh, to get in to make an effort in the field in, of social justice. Um, I had been interested in social justice my whole life. Um, so that's how I got started in here. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go on here. I do, this is, as you can see, this is a cover of my book. I do presentations, workshops, and also book clubs. Uh, I mentioned book clubs because uh, <clears throat> I wanted to start off with a book club comment that was made. I was doing a book club for um, a colleague of mine and she had about 20 women over and uh, we're, to discuss the book. They read the book, we were discussing it and they had great questions. Uh, and then somewhere into the evening, this one woman said, um, you know, after reading your book, uh, I finally understand my husband. And we all, we all kind of got a chuckle out of that because it's, a, it's not a book about marriages or anything, but uh, it turned out that uh, she described, she, she, I questioned her a little bit and then, and then uh, she uh, let out some information that was really helpful in understanding and I think pertinent to what uh, I'm talking about here tonight. Uh, she said her, her husband uh, had grown up in uh, New York City in a tough section of New York City. Um, at night, there was always a lot of <clears throat> loud music and crowds outside, gunshots and sirens. And uh, she said he never got much sleep. He would go to school the next day and that's where he would get his sleep. Um, so, and then she said when they moved up here uh, to one of the suburban uh, uh, towns, uh, she said they were, he was going around, for instance, uh, one night and going to Wegmans, you know, he was asking, the checkout uh, girls, uh, uh, you know, is it safe here? She said, well, of course it's safe here. I mean, but what I got to see was the, the long-term, the lingering effects on this man. And, I, and that's what this woman meant that night, that her, what was happening was that uh, some of the lingering effects of of his background were still with him and not leaving. And they were, would be hard to understand. Uh, and I, what I hope to be able to do after tonight uh, is, is show you what, uh, uh, 
what the underlying factors are that could cause a problem like that, uh, what those underlying factors are. <clears throat> so um, I, I joined, well, let me, let's go back. I'm just gonna leave this right here. Um, I got involved with a church group uh, having to do with uh, poverty. And then I wound up uh, working on the Rochester Children's Zone, which was an effort to try to get our city in the, uh, with the kinds of support that Jeffrey Canada had gotten for, uh, the, uh, for the same kind of makeup down in Harlem. Um, I also got involved with uh, Action for a Better Community. I did some mentoring and tutoring there. And I also started to develop this PowerPoint so that I could show people what we were seeing. My wife and I, my wife was also quite active with me uh, in this whole venture. Um, so, and <clears throat> as I went on, I think I went in with kind of this, you know, the savior complex. Uh, I know what the problem is here and I know how to, I think I have some suggestions to help people solve this. And after a couple of years, I realized uh, I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't understand the problem. I had no idea on what to do about it. I just knew that I was looking at a really a heartbreaking problem here. Um, and so for me, I did what, uh, you know, typical introvert does, you know, you go home, get alone, get a piece of paper and a pencil out and I started making a list. Um, and so I wrote down, number one, people in poverty um, make decisions based on survival. Uh, and now I had something, it was there and I knew this was a factor. I had re read this and Ruby Payne who's an author on, on poverty, a really good one. And uh, so, and I knew that this was a factor. I was observing it and I heard Dr. Uh, Dr. Fred Rogush at the Mount Hope Family Center describe it this way, you survive the day and the next day you start all over and survive that day. And if that's the way your decision-making is going, uh, it does not speak well for education and certainly not for careers or anything that has to do with long-term planning. So I wrote down number two, discourse. Um, I wrote a sentence about this. What I said was that uh, children of poverty uh, speak in the casual register while their teachers are speaking in the formal register. And that may not sound like much, but think about it. You're going into school, you're used to casual register, but you're, all the information is being delivered in a different register. That is not the kind of smooth transition that we would like to see. Now, there are ways around that, but still it gets in the way. So number three, I listed this one after, um, after seeing the, the Betty Hart and Todd Risley uh, re, uh, research, they were researchers down at the University of Kansas. Uh, and they found that uh, kids in generational poverty have half the vocabulary of kids who have advantaged parents. Now, for a whole group to, to have half the vocabulary, I mean, it just, didn't make sense. Why would that be? So number four, I said, well, if, that, if these are the case, then now we're gonna have trouble with reading, certainly. And we know now that they're living in different realities, which people in middle class and wealth are not going to understand. Um, and then that would lead to being judged and probably to shame and how would you get out if you didn't know the rules of class, of middle class and, and wealth? Um, and you, in poverty, your needs cannot all be met. And you probably are lacking the vocabulary for sophisticated enough voice, you know, individual voice to talk you through problem solving. And what was happening here was this developing list. Uh, the you know one, two, and three le leading to all of the other 10. And I knew I was onto something. Now, if you were just dealing with this, these 10 pieces, 
uh, you've got problems in your life. Uh, but of course, this was not the end. This was right here. I kept writing and writing and I came up with these 90 impacts of poverty. Um, and if, uh, if you take a look here, let me, uh, I think I'm gonna get my laser. I'm gonna use the pen at first. As you go up and down, you'll see down to, till you get up around maybe 35, 34 diseases. Uh, things have to do with language in school and reading and, and things like that. But now all of a sudden, we have to consider disease, trauma, um, and really the brain, uh, which is at the base of all this, uh, which is now going to determine an awful lot. And once the brain gets involved, well, now, now we have quite some implications that are possible. And that's where all of the rest of this comes in. Now, I realize this is a lot of stuff to just look at, you know, this, but just the thing that I think to do that, that's good now to do is just look at it and realize if kids are going around with all of these things as impacts in their lives, to a great extent or to a lesser extent, but they're overwhelmed. And so are their parents. And if you go down here to number 90, born, which is the last one on the list, uh, if a child is born into generational poverty, then that child is born into all of this, all of these 90 impacts. So that's where the 90 uh, feet under came from. These 90 impacts, I think, are devastating on people who live in poverty and I think are much more responsible, in fact, totally responsible for, for, for why people have a tough time getting out of it and why it affects them so long. And, and like this woman's husband now was still showing signs uh, later on, you know, he's probably successful in business, and, but he can't let go of that past, which is still ingrained in him. Um, so uh, we'll get back to this uh, list in a second here. So I was playing golf two days ago. This was, we're, we're in Chautauqua right now, my wife and I, and I was playing with my, one of the guys here. <clears throat> and we got up to the 13th tee and this sign was on the 13th tee. Between which years in a child's life does the most rapid brain development occur? Hmm. Well, it turns out the Chautauqua Lake uh, Child Care Center was having a fundraiser that day and that's where this thing came in, this little uh, sign. Uh, but the neat part of it was I looked at this and I said to my golfing buddy, I said, I know the answer to this one. And uh, actually I better know the answer to it because I'll be talking about it with you tonight. Um, between which years in a child's life does the most rapid brain development occur? Well, as my own physician told me, he said that would be between, oops, let's see if zero and three. Um, what happens here to understand what's going on with the brain is that you're born with about 90 billion brain cells. And each of those cells can connect with 10,000 others. That means you have a million billion action and each of those could be undone and replaced and redone in another way. And Dr. Daniel Siegel calls this in a developing mind. He says that this is one of the, uh, it is the most complex system on earth, uh, human made or not. <clears throat> the other part about the brain is that when a child is born, uh, the specialized areas of the brain are really not connected yet, nor are they fully developed. For instance, the, the frontal lobe uh, where we do our thinking, uh, that's not connected to, let's say the hippocampus where, where uh, our memory starts to take place or the amygdala, which has to do with emotion and is important for the way we develop. So none of these important areas of the brain are connected. But as soon as a child is born, we find an extremely robust uh, connection going on. 
actually cells are starting to connect at the rate of one to two million a second for the child, for the newborn child. So what we have then go, um, is, whoop, I'm going to have to go back here to my list. What those connections are doing then are making what's called integrative fibers between the specialized areas of the brain. And the problem is, if you're living in poverty and you don't have the nutrition and you don't have the right health care and you might not have the clothes and you might be sick a lot, well, that can impact your integrative fibers. And in fact, it can impact everything else that's on the list that you see here at the same time. So, well, so what I'm going to do with you here, uh, I'll give you a little overview right here. We're gonna talk about the science involved here. I think it's important to get, get some ideas of the underlying science so that you get a feel for how seriously impacted uh, people in poverty are. In fact, anybody who's under a lot of stress. Uh, we'll look at discourse, the way we, people talk and uh, the languages of, of the three classes. And also we'll talk about realities too. The realities uh, are different for people in poverty as they are for people in middle class as they are for people in wealth. Um, and I'll start off with uh, Terence here, a little story. Uh, Ter when I first got involved um, with, with social justice, we were at a, a church over on Portland Avenue and uh, I went to a hot dog roast over there and then, so it's my first time and I'm, you know, I look different than most other people there and I don't know, and I'm an introvert and I, you know, I'm, it's hard enough for me to figure out what to say in situations like that. So I'm figuring out what, how do, what do I do now? Where do, where do I go? And I see this kid who's sitting over, he's, he's about as thin as a rail and he's sitting against the church steps and the church itself. I mean, the rest of the action is going on on the lawn. So he's all by himself. And then he's got these crutches next to him. And I thought, okay, here's my in. Because, you know, I'm a teacher in Pittsburgh. Um, I see kids all the time with, uh, you know, blown out ACLs from soccer or lacrosse or, uh, you know, or, or skiing and things like that. So I go over to this kid and you know, I said, so what happened here? And he looks up at me and he says, I got shot. And he was angry and he spat it out and I didn't know what, what to do. It was like I was off my game and I tried to persist with some fumbling with some conversation there um, and it really didn't work out too well. I did not make too much progress with him. Uh, and in fact, we didn't make too much progress with each other. Uh, so maybe about six months later, um, he had a chance to do some explaining of what life is like over there to some of the people um, that, that, that accompanied me over at the church. And so I asked him one day, we were on the inside, we were in the gym, the church gym over on Portland Avenue, this is. And we were sitting on the edge of the gym, you know, with our feet hanging down. Uh, we were sitting on a, like a stage. And then there were about 20 kids playing out in the gym. And, Terrence, of course, couldn't do that because uh, of the injury, uh, which what had happened to him was some kid on the street for a reason that he could never really give me a satisfactory answer to, uh, shot, to, started shooting a gun. And a bullet went through Terrence's left shin bone and shattered that. And then it went in through the right shin bone and shattered that. And then the bullet stopped. and. On, on the inside underneath the skin. Um, so he was having trouble. He still was getting pain. I mean, I mean, he's still a young man, so he's able to do things, but uh, you could see he was in pain. And I, he told me he was in pain, especially in cold weather. Um, so we were sitting there and I, I said to him, I said, you know, I was watching when you were explaining these things to people about, you know, what you're going through here. I said, and I'm, I want to set up a program at our church uh, where 
you know, maybe I'm going to get some people to come in and talk to people about, you know, what life is like for you here. I said, would you be interested in doing that? And um, he kind of looked at me and he said, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to do that. And then he said, you want to feel the bullet? And I, I said, yeah, yeah, yes. And so he pulled his leg up, his right leg up to the stage, you know, his foot, and then he pulled up his pant leg and then he took my hand and then he, he put it on his, on the shin bone there. And, and you could feel it was like a grape underneath the skin where this bullet was. Um, so when we, we think about the pain that get register, gets registered for this kid comes in two forms. One, he just feels the pain. The bullet hurts sometimes, his legs hurt sometimes. And when, when you get that kind of pain, um, it gets registered in a part of the brain that's called the anterior cingulate. Now, that might not be too important for us to know tonight, except that when he thinks about the terror of that moment, the terror also gets registered in the anterior cingulate. I just thought that is a in very interesting combination there, real pain, and imagine pain being registered in the same part of the brain. So there are a couple of things that we should talk about here and we'll get these out of the way, some like housekeeping here uh, to get some definitions. A family of four living in poverty must survive on approximately $24,000 a year. Uh, and if this is what your family of four is living on, you do not have enough to meet your needs. Um, so what that means is that you're always doing without something. And it could be food, it could be clothing, uh, maybe you get evicted, uh, maybe you're cold. I mean, or several things like that all at the same time, or maybe all of them at the same time. Uh, so that's what's going on in the life of people who live in poverty. Uh, they can't have their needs met. Um, that brings about some driving forces in poverty uh, that I want to want to mention specifically. One of them is survival, as I mentioned, which is critical because what this means is that instead of laying out long-term plans, you're going by what do they? You know, maybe you can figure it out a week ahead, but you may not be able to do that if everything, if you're gonna wind up maybe losing it all, or maybe you need clothes or any of those factors comes in. Um, relationships are extremely in, important in poverty. This is, a, is very important to know about uh, if you're thinking in terms of poverty, um, because you're, as Ruby Payne says, your friends help you stay alive in poverty. So your friends are crucial, and so are your family members. You do see a lot of sharing in poverty. Uh, family, families stick together. Sometimes they form entirely different uh, kind of branches and webs than we in middle class and, and wealth are used to would understand even. Um, but relationships are critical and that's always to be kept in mind because it governs how the decisions that a, a lot of people make. Um, another big deal is um, entertainment. If uh, what happens is that entertainment can lift the pain of poverty, even if only for a little while. So you see somebody buying the big TV uh, at a time when you might be saying, how in the world did they ever afford that? Well, they probably didn't afford it. Um, and that brings me to a story I want to bring to you about uh, a girl named Gloria that my wife and I mentored. Uh, Gloria was born to, her mom was addicted to cocaine, so Gloria was addicted to cocaine. And um, 
Gloria's mom also did not want to raise her. So her grandmother, uh, Gloria's grandmother said, I will take the child. The problem here was that Gloria's grandmother lived in poverty. I suspect maybe had some, um, maybe had some mental health issues going on uh, and really was destitute sometimes, but she was an absolute sweetheart and just did everything she could to raise Gloria. So fast forward, you know, uh, 19 years, Gloria is now uh, a senior at the School of the Arts. She's trying to get her high school diploma. And this is the middle of January. One day she comes home, grandma's just bought this big TV. It's up on the wall. Grandma went, why, why did you do that? Well, she did it because she wanted it and she needed it and she, it's probably like any of us, you finally crack and you say, I'm going to go out and do this. And she bought this TV. The problem was that the gas and electric couldn't be paid. So that was shut off. This is January. Gloria said, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I had to leave. Uh, she wound up going to Hillside, which helped arrange for her to emancipate herself and find some living conditions and be able to keep going to school, you know, and get food and, and some clothing um, like that. And Gloria told this story to our church group uh, and, and she was just sobbing as she told us because what she had to do to do that was to leave her grandmother behind and relationships, you are critical. Uh, she understood full well what her grandmother had done for her. But she knew what she had to do for herself here too. Interesting, grandma lived upstairs on the third floor, I believe. Gloria's father lived on the second floor. So one of the things they did was run an electric line out of his window up to grandma's window to help run, you know, electrical things while the electric and gas were shut off in her apartment. Of course, they could only do this under, under darkness because the landlord wouldn't allow that to go on. So you see the complications that, that they have to live with here. Um, so I, I mentioned this, uh, how close is our DNA? Because um, I, I think you'll know all the answers here, but um, we forget it because we've been taught for so long that something else is the case. Um, so how close is our DNA? Well, it's about 99.95% the same, much less than a thousandth that we differ by. And all of these folks are not the same different as all of these folks. Um, interesting here, I'm gonna point out three people here. One is this guy, whoop, I'm, and this one, okay, Caucasian, Asian, Caucasian. And I mentioned that for one reason here. Uh, back in 1998, there was the audacious uh, genetic scientist, his name is uh, Craig Venter. And he said, I am going to sequence the entire human genome. In other words, everything that makes up your DNA, he was going to sequence it. And all the geneticists of the world said, you're nuts, you can't do that. And in 2000, he said, I have done it. And he had. Uh, working with his uh, company, Celera Genomics, uh, there were three of them, these three guys right here that I'm pointing out, um, Caucasian, uh, Asian, Caucasian. I'm pointing them out for a specific reason here. And that was this. Some of the things they found when they looked at the human genome was one of the things was they could not tell an African-American from a Caucasian, from a Hispanic, from an Asian, or from a Native American. They could not tell the difference. Now they're looking at the gene structures. A second interesting thing that happened was that when they looked at their own genomes, which they did, they were able to plot their own, uh, Venter's genome had more in common with the Asian uh, that he was working with than they did between Venter and the other Caucasian. 
And the other Caucasian also had more in common with the Asian than he did with Venter. So these are things I mentioned because not because there's blame involved here or anything like that, but we think something our whole lives. And when you look at this fan, we might even be able to make predictions or maybe think of predictions on who is what. Um, but it turns out the genes are the same. They distribute the same way and they are basically the same. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. Poverty in the United States, um, this will be the last list I'll, I'll give you for in a few seconds here. Uh, this is from the 2016 census. Uh, poverty in the United States gives us some interesting ideas here. In poverty in 2016, this is before, uh, in poverty about 40 million in the United States. And that was 12.7% of the population. Of those uh, white people made up 27 million of that and that was 11.6% of the white population. And for black people, that made up 9,234,000. Uh, and that was 24% of the black population. So there are two things. I, I bring these up. I think it's worth it to look at this particular statistic, which is kind of like the same statistics over the last 60 years you'll see basically the same thing going on. Um, if I were to question in Rochester, what color is the face of I'm sure the answer would be black. I think it's in many areas of the country, people think that black people are all live in poverty. But as you look here, you can see that there are three times as many white people in poverty as there are black people in poverty. So that's different than we think. So you find three times as many up here. Um, as we go over here to these percentage figures, we can see here that black people enter poverty at twice the rate of white people. Now, if the genes are the same, if the DNA is the same, if they fall into line, distribute randomly, but this in the same way, how, how can this be all of the time that this figure is roughly twice this? And here, what I think we're talking about is structural racism. Something is baked into the picture here so that this always happens. And if you go back 60 years uh, and looking at the, the US uh, poverty figures in the census, you'll find the same pattern there. So what I wanna do next then is get into the, the underlying science here, really microscopic effects and this is going on in a way that how could we ever have known? I mean, until modern research came along the computer and then people figuring out ways to use the computers uh, to do medical research and, and all different kinds of science research. Uh, how could we have known this? Well, what happens here is that you get these stressors of poverty that mount up from 90 different impacts all the time, the overwhelming effect, um, and those invade the brain. Um, and how they enter the brain is, well, the brain gets this information. It could be stressors of all kinds. It could be like uh, with Terrence, it could be pain from his wounds. It could be pain just from thinking of the horror of being shot. It could be lots of different ways that stress enters the brain. Once it does enter the brain though, it now has an easy access to the rest of the body. And that's through the central nervous system, which is made up of these other brain cells. So stress gets passed off to the neurons in the brain or the neurons are brain cells. And then the neurons pass that off to say the chromosomes, whatever they are, 
Actually, we'll find out in a few seconds here. And the chromosomes will react by created, creating what's called DNA agent. Another name for that that's been very popular in the last year and a half is comorbidity. Now, I'm gonna flash up here a science picture. If science was not your thing, don't be frightened. I'm going to take you by the hand and walk you through the diagram. Uh, and let's take a look at this. Uh, don't look, try to look at too much at this at one time. Follow my laser pointer here. And there are really a couple of parts that, that'll be interesting for us in all of this. Right here that I'm pointing out is your body cell. Typical body cell, you have about 37 and a half trillion of these that make up your body. You know, your skin cells and, you know, immune cells and all the different cells, your muscle tissue, the cells all add up, 37 and a half trillion of those uh, make up your body. Well, inside the cell is the chromosome. And actually there are 46 chromosomes in each cell. I don't wanna give you too many numbers though. So this is a chromosome, it's there inside the cell. And if you take a look at the chromosome, there's something down here at the tip of it. And that's called a telomere. And this is really a name that's coming uh, mentioned quite a bit these days, even in the news, you'll see telomeres mentioned. Uh, here at Chautauqua last year, um, I heard, uh, and it was two years ago, uh, it was, um, I think it was Scott Kelly, it was one of the Kellys. <laughs> I think it was Mark, I can't remember whether it was Mark or Scott Kelly came back from outer space, he was there for a year. He said when he got back that his telomeres were off about 7%. And that was important because what happens with the telomeres, if they're nice and long and healthy, then your chromosomes do what they're supposed to do. But if these are not nice and long and healthy and they can get shorter through stress, then your chromosomes do not do what they're supposed to do. Now, one thing that the chromosomes do that we'll pay attention to here is this. One of the jobs of the chromosome, it's a huge one, by the way, when your body cell gets tired, what happens is the chromosome says, you're not doing your job right. What I want you to do is split in two. And what the cell will do now is split in two and you'll get an identical cell because your DNA is all wrapped up inside the chromosome, you'll get an identical cell that's healthy and the old cell gets absorbed into the body. Sometimes they may be used to help other areas of the body, but usually absorbed into the body. So you get a new cell, it performs like a, you know, a healthy fresh cell <clears throat> and then you go on your way, your body stays healthy. Where the comorbidity comes in is this, if that telomere is shortened due to stress, the replacement cell may not be as healthy as it's supposed to be. That leads to a string of events. It calls out to the body for help. The body starts sending in fluids. Fluids can't penetrate the cell. Fluids build up, you get inflammation. And so what happens then is this replacement cell isn't doing the job you can wind up with Crohn's disease, celiac disease, cardiovascular problems, uh, immune system problems. All of that can happen from this little telomere down here, stress making it shorter and too short to do its job. Okay, that's what's going on underneath with chromosomes. Uh, I wanna take a look at one other thing here. Stressors of poverty invade the body. The stress enters the neurons. The neurons take it, takes it down to the HPA axis. That's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis. And that secretes your hormones. Uh, and one of the big ones is cortisol. 
And of course, we know that that affects kids who live in poverty. Um, I mean, this little girl, uh, let's say she has to deal with mom's depression. Maybe mom's a single mom deal, trying to raise the kids, dealing with 90 impacts of poverty all the time. She might be dealing with depression. The child may be dealing with depression. If she is, she's probably got more cortisol than she should be getting. Uh, maybe she runs into a trauma situation. This happens all the time for kids in poverty. How about fear? She goes to school in the morning, there are gangs on the corner. Fear, her body will produce uh, cortisol to help her deal with that. Uh, poverty is the number one predictor of child abuse. People start to lose it and they lose their kids. This is understandable that it's gonna happen. That's progression. Well, cortisol to the rescue. Um, fight, flight, freeze. She hears a gunshot. Her body, her reptilian brain will send out some cortisol. So what you're looking at here then are all of these different factors in, in, a, in a typical poverty child's day. And you get a secretion of cortisol here, cortisol, 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 cortisol. What the body now starts to do is realize that's too much cortisol. Um, it starts to try to stop the cortisol production. Um, well, what that means, you can now have damage to the HPA axis. Uh, stress regulation can be impaired with this child and her cognitive skills can be diminished. Cortisol in the blood doesn't go away for hours. So if she goes to school and this cortisol buildup is still there, she's not learning at school the way she should be. Not her fault. And so what happens is we get the situation that we're looking at like this. This kid is sitting there saying, why can't I learn? Well, something else may be going on with her. Uh, it could be that her genes are being silenced. It's a process called epigenesis. And I'm taking a risk here of lumping a whole bunch of stuff on you. But this is a term you'd want to know about too, epigenesis or epigenetics. What's happening here is even though you start out with genes uh, that are functioning well, uh, what happens is the, the, uh, the pressure, the stresses can send in thing, molecules of histones and methyl groups that make the on and off switches of the genes not work as they should. So genes can be shut off or silenced. Has nothing to do with her abilities. I had somebody here and in Chautauqua last year was asking me about my breath and said, well, you know, maybe it's just bad genes. No, it's not bad genes. Everybody gets about the same genes, but yours could be silenced if you're under an undue amount of stress. And this can happen to all of us. But of course, for people in poverty, where you have 90 impacts all of the time on you, it's more likely that that's going to happen there. Uh, so the result of this, your executive functions are impaired. And that's what this little girl is saying to herself. Well, why can't I get this? Her skills for planning, memory, flexibility, and impulse control can all be uh, negatively affected. Do we see that happening in high poverty areas? Yes. Um, so that's the underlying science here. And I appreciate you sticking around for me to, to talk about it. Um, well, this gives me a chance to get into discourse. Uh, these are, this is some, some ways in which there are some ways in which um, and every language uh, the earth has <clears throat> it's our formal characters formal of 
Yeah, we're having a little trouble hearing. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you need to focus okay. right on. Yeah, just it's a little bit different. It's going in and out. Yeah, kind of echoing too. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Oops, what happened? Peggy, I think maybe he left and is coming back. Oh, is he? Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lara. Yeah. Hit sure. Him. I the uh, I, I think it's a connectivity it was, issue. Yeah. Difficulty hearing it seemed to be. Uh, did you folks under hear that too? It seemed to be. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Maybe he did go back. Okay. Yeah. Well, he isn't. He's in Chautauqua, so maybe that. I don't know what that was. Yeah. Okay. John is muted. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Unmute, John. Oh, can't hear you. Okay. There yeah. we go. You okay. Yeah, we couldn't. We I got gotcha. you. All right. Well, I think no problem. I okay. have to get my my PowerPoint up here. Okay. Let's yeah. See. Let me see if I can bring this up again. No, that's not it. Well, I can just talk about yeah, how we there. talk anyway. <laughs> okay, is it, if, on the sharing, it's not working then? Is it? Okay. Um, let me see here. Here we go. Got it there? Okay. Oh, well, I, I am not uh, visible on the uh, the webcam, but this is uh, Nancy. Uh, John, this is your Chautauqua uh, connection. And I find uh, this whole idea of neighborhood and poverty um, very fascinating, but I do know several years ago, and I'm wondering if you can hear me, uh, several years ago, my sister was doing uh. the census, and she was in a poor neighborhood in downtown Rochester. There were four chronological adults, one 12-year-old boy going off to school who said he was hungry, and they gave him a bottle of Right to see him through the day. So there is a very different way of thinking um, oh, yes, among, well, is, what else yeah. is new among people? Oh, th well, thanks for that, Nancy. Yeah, that's quite interesting that you know somebody who was in, in Rochester too. Uh, we were looking at the same, the same kinds of things there. Now with the, the language registers, um, Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, formal register is used for tasks and that's why it's used in businesses and school. Uh, casual register is used for relationships. Um, and I'm gonna erase that for a second because when I first got started doing this, the, I got to this section with casual registers and I knew from Ruby Payne and from what I heard, you know, just from what I observed, that casual register was used in poverty, but I didn't know why. And it was a Native American woman who was doing my spiel one night and she said, well, you got that casual register, right? She said, you come to see us on a res and you better be prepared to spend a couple of hours. We're gonna sit down and talk and get to know each other. And I thought, ah, this is what it is. It's relationships. Casual register is used in poverty, not because you don't have the gene structure that you're supposed to, not because your DNA uh, is wrong or anything like that. It's because you need friends and friends help you stay alive in poverty. Mm -hmm. And that's why casual register is so important uh, in poverty for those who live in poverty. Uh, so I think we have to change the way we think of this. Uh, you know, it, it may not be something wrong if somebody's using casual register and it's a register that we're not used to hearing. Uh, potential problems, of course, for, for this little guy, if he's, he lives in poverty, he's used to hearing casual register all the time and using it all the time. His teacher is going to be speaking in formal register that's a disconnect. If you're 
hearing this stuff here, your, your, your education delivered in a different uh, register, that takes some adjustments to do. Um, the same thing happens in a situation like this. You see the doctor here, his, uh, his posture is formal. That's probably how he went into this. He's used to formal register. Dad here, maybe he needs signs of trust. Uh, in other words, before he can go on, he needs to know he can trust this guy. And if this guy, doctor, had taken some time, maybe at the beginning, to make sure this was a relaxed situation, maybe this guy would be saying, I think I can trust this guy. Maybe he's got something to say about my son. Um, I mentioned Latasha here because I want to just talk about it. Um, a situation I ran into, I was uh, tutoring and mentoring a young woman. Her name was Latasha. She was 21 years old. This is not her name, by the way. In fact, none of the names that I'm using are, are the names of kids I, I needed to use to protect them. Um, so Latasha, I was, she was trying to get her GED. Uh, ironically, she was going through. Oh, sorry. sorry, Jen. No, wait a minute. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh. Wait a minute. John, wait a minute. Oh. I got to unmute, John. Sorry. Wait a minute. Oh. Wait a minute. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, I'm sorry. Hello. Mistake. Good. No, I'm okay. I got it. Sorry. So I was working. I was working at uh, Action for a Better Community, and I was tutoring this uh, young woman, 21 years old. She had a child, uh, and she told me that she was, she had been successful in high school, uh, pretty much, and then she she got pregnant her senior year. She had two credits to go. Uh, she had the baby. She had to leave school for a couple of years. Went back. And they said, no, you can't, you're 21, you can't. Oh, she did go back and then she turned 21 and they said, you can't be here anymore because you're 21 and you're not allowed to be in school. So now we had this, this young woman trying to get her GED. I mean, when she could have had a diploma, I was like, so anyway, she's, we're trying to get her diploma and, and I'm working uh, her GED and uh, so we're working on a math problem and all of a sudden her cell phone goes off. And I, I know not to get in the way of cell phones because cell phones are relationships and relationships are critical. Um, so anyway, she takes this, so she says, can I take this? Yeah, go ahead, take it. So she takes the call. She gets uh, a, a little bit flustered, you know, and finally says, run, run, run. And then she turns off the phone. I say, hmm, is there everything okay? And she says, yeah. So we started a math problem. Um, she just crump, crunches up the paper. And I said, what's going on here? <clears throat> and she said, it's my sister. She said, I'm supposed to go to a job interview today, uh, but I had to go first to get my papers, <clears throat> excuse me, my medical papers from the doctor's office. And, and she was gonna give me a ride. She said, but now she's not gonna do it. And I said, well, since, since the tutoring seems like it's over for today, um, I said, supposing I give you a ride, you know, over to the doctor's office to get your papers. And she said, oh, you would do that? And I said, yeah. So, and then all of a sudden this frown on her face, she's thinking. I said, well, what's, what's the problem here? She said, well, the doctor said to pick up the papers at one o'clock and it's only 11 o'clock. And I said, well, maybe you could call a doctor up and ask if you could get your papers now. And she just stared at me. Now, this was a woman who was negotiating poverty and all those 90 impacts, plus a child, and she was married too, and making a living. And she was, you know, was bent on doing this on her own, you know, with her family. And yet when it came to asking the doctor for papers a couple hours early, she was almost at a loss here. So I said, call the doctor up, you know, and ask. So 
she did. She took the phone. She called up the doctor. All of a sudden, this big smile on her face. She says, I can pick up the papers now. We, I, we got in the car, took her over to the doctor's office. She got the papers. I took her to her uh, interview, and she had a job that afternoon. I mean, when you think of this, the what you're looking at down here in this picture now, think about what could be going on here that isn't even said that maybe keeps this guy from asking a question or something or keeps this guy from springing it open so this guy can ask the question that may be critical in the situation here. Um, we have differences in classes, sometimes differences in color too, that bring about these same roadblocks. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I got to <clears throat> children of poverty. There's a little list here. I just wanna mention half the vocabulary of advantaged kids. Uh, they're spoken to less frequently by their parents. Uh, in children of poverty, this is, they speak to their parents less frequently, significantly less frequently. And they hear fewer words per hour. Uh, from their parents. Quite interesting, this is all from the Betty Hart and, and Todd Risley study, which is just fascinating. And in addition, there are big gaps and differences between encouragements versus prohibitions by parents per hour. Um, for advantaged parents, advantaged parents give their kids 32 positives and five negative per hour. And poverty parents give their kids five positives and 11 negatives per hour. This, I believe, makes a significant difference in the way kids learn to approach challenges. This number of positives and also this gap with negatives here. Listen, two to one negatives for parents uh, of poverty, almost a seven, seven to one. Uh, positives in the uh, positives over negatives uh, for advantaged parents. Does that mean these parents love their kids more? I don't believe that's the case. But I do believe that when you're dealing with those 90 impacts all the time, uh, you may not be, uh, you may not have all the patience in the world all of the time. I also have to think, Kathy Bond here because she's on tonight. Kathy was one of my first readers. I'll mention this because this is this is a library now, and it, and this is a book. Uh, and when I one of the early drafts, um, Kathy agreed to read for me, and we got up here and it was I think I said encouragements versus prohibits or something like that. She said, "What what's prohibits? What do you mean?" So I had to, and then I went and and used the right words here prohibition. So see, that's why you have readers. You get editors and they straighten you out. And she did. And I'm grateful, Kathy. Now, I want to talk also about the hidden rules of class. I think it's important that we know about the differences in classes and some just some of the rules that we use. Um, because if you don't know the rules of class and you're in any either of the classes that you wind up in, uh, then you get excluded. People will think you're you know, they look at you funny. Um, but before we do that, we'll take a little quiz here. Um, and I want to make a prediction here. I'm go going to assume that probably most or all of the people uh, here tonight are live in middle class or, or wealth. Uh, and I could be wrong with that assumption. What's the main concern for people living in generational poverty? Uh, think about this for a second. Don't give me anything out loud, but think to yourself, what do you think would be their main concern? Okay. Uh, I, I have to confess here, I don't know the answer to this question, um, but I think I do. Um, it came up out of uh, something a life coach said, <clears throat> who was working at uh, Action for a Better Community. 
Action for a Better Community in Rochester has this uh, a program for uh, self-sufficiency for people who live in poverty. Can it, they can attend this 10 week program. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so this life coach said she had told um, the people in this particular cycle in that program. She said, if you have any concerns, you know, why don't you come in on a Thursday? We'll take an hour, sit down, just us. And then you can tell me, you know, what concerns that you want to talk about. And then she told us later on what the concern that was coming up the most uh, for people in poverty. Um, and it was shame. It wasn't what probably most of us in middle class and wealth would think of first. Well, food, safety for your kids, clothing, but it was shame. If you can't feed your kids, what does that do to you? And in one of the books I ran into in my research, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the authors Fickert and I can't remember the other one now, sorry about that. Uh, they quoted people uh, from a whole bunch of different countries, Vietnam, China, <clears throat> uh, Guinea-Bissau, and the quote was the same from the person in poverty. If I can't feed my kids, I am ashamed. And so you see what we may think is, you know, would be the most important thing for us. Uh, it's maybe a little different when you get into that particular, um, when you are in that particular class. Now, <clears throat> Ruby Payne did a couple of these things. I'm going to show you one of them, and I have made up one of my own here. Um, how we think about food is different. And this might not even seem like a big deal. But if you're in poverty and you think about food differently than people in middle class and wealth, and you're supposed to go to a restaurant, this is going to be on your mind. What do I do here? Well, so what statement? would you expect to hear uh, maybe if you're uh, living in poverty around the dinner table afterwards, maybe the question that mom asks is this, did you have enough? In middle class, what do you think would be asked? Well, I remember my mother, I, was, I grew up middle class. Did you like it? I can still hear my mother saying this after guests were over. Do you think they liked it? I hope they liked it. My wife says the same thing. She does the cooking for us. And in wealth, was it well presented? Yeah, so you go over to the Genesee Valley Club, you know you're gonna have good food prepared just the right way, but it will also look uh, the way it should. Is there anything wrong with any of these three things? No. Um, but it's, it, it, it's what makes sense for that particular class. But now you can start to see how it might be difficult to jump from one class to another. If you're gonna leave poverty, in addition to just being able to leave it, you've gotta know what the rules are. You need some kind of mentor that will help you with the rules of the other class. Now, where do we learn all of these rules anyway in the first place? Well. It happens up here, and I need to get my magic laser pointer again. Um, what happens is, you know, mom says, let's say in, you're living in poverty, and here's a boy, here's his mom say, everybody get enough here for dinner tonight? And what happens is that gets into his neural nets, all right? It hits a brain cell, and that takes, hands it off to another brain cell, and these are synapses here. Pew, pew. These are actually firing off. Their electrochemical processes and connecting neural nets to each other so that you wind up with a particular net of a thought. And the next day, mom says after a meal, everybody get enough around here. All of those synapses are firing off. The same cycle gets fired off again. And what happens with brain cells like this, we know that cells that fire together wire together. In other words, you get a stronger and stronger uh, message uh, emblazoned in the brain, if you will. So you can see now that these hidden rules 
we do them over and over again and then we learn them and then it's part of us. Um, one of the areas that people, particularly in, in middle class and wealth, do not understand about people in poverty. Well, why don't they go get an education? You know, it's um, if they would just do that, everything would be fine. Well, as it turns out, in poverty, something else comes first. Mom, I've got two tests today. You're not going to school today. It's Monday, remember? You're staying home to watch these kids. I got to take two buses to get out to Penfield, clean houses out there, put, put food on this table. And don't you be looking at me like that. And you feed those kids. Well, if this girl is missing every Monday, that's 20% of her classes. And that's what the average kid in the city was missing. Um, the last time I checked a couple of years ago, this is pre-COVID time. In middle class, school comes first and you're able to do it. Uh, if, if, if the child is sick, then probably you'll get a babysitter or you'll find some way to cover there. But the child is probably not gonna have to cover for other kids in the family. They're probably not gonna have to do jobs that are ad adult jobs. I mean, rarely, yes, things happen. And in, in wealth, connection base comes first. Of course, you're going to school, but it'll be the best school for you, the best school for making the connections that we want you to be able to make. Um, so finish line, yeah, it's pretty close to here. And then I'll, I'll take any questions too. Uh, I have two go goals here. Uh, and then I'm gonna read you Terrell's letter. Uh, I'll explain a little more about that in a second. Um, and here are the two goals that I personally would like you to walk away with. One is this, a mindset that poverty can be ended, that this can be ended. I know it's practically biblical. Sometimes they'll quote and say, well, Jesus said, you know, the poor will always be with us. Does that have to be? I don't think he was saying that, that it had to be. But I think we need the mindset that poverty can be ended. And then we have to be prepared to act when the answer comes. We haven't figured it out yet. But until we do that, I have to read you this letter that I got. <clears throat> and what happened was at the time, uh, Terrell was a little boy, a nine-year-old. I decided to start a big buddy program. It was like a, uh, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> oh, big brother, big sister program. And uh, so my wife and I both got involved with, I got involved with Terrell who was nine years old. He was at the drop-in center and my, uh, my wife uh, got involved with his sister who was an eight-year-old. And we, for the next five months, he was nine. And for the next five months, I picked him up every Wednesday and we did something. We'd go bowling or we'd go, we'd go to the library, we'd go to a bookstore, we would, and we'd do his homework together. And, and then there were other times that we got together to do things too. There were so, some special events. Um, and one of the best times we had was at the, God, I almost, I almost had to twist his arm behind his back. No, you wouldn't do that at the, at the, at the museum. And then, cause he didn't want to no, know, I'm not going in here. And he said, by the way, my father's the principal of this. My father's the director here. <laughs> so we get down and what, what was the best thing of all the things in the museum that day was this little, they had a sandbox where they trickled water through it and kids could just dam things up. And he got involved there. He didn't want to leave it. And I wasn't going to move him either. And then there were other kids too. So he's working with other kids. They're making dams. And then you could see the erosion and what happened. I mean, it was just fantastic. So we were, um, we were together as a, you know, uh, I was a mentor for him for about five months. And then, um, I had a situation come up where 
uh, his his mom called me up and said to me one day, you know, he he wasn't he's not been behaving in school, and if and if 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 that's going to be what mentoring is about, then we're not going to do the mentoring anymore. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what's what's going on here? So she explained to me he had run out of class in school and he had some issues. So um, that could happen with him. So I said, you're going, are you going to talk to the principal about this? And she said, yeah, we have a meeting next week. I said, can I go? Said, yes. So I went with them and uh, the principal of the school was wonderful. I mean, they had really, were doing a, a really good job of what, how to handle this situation. Um, so, and they were getting things in place for exploring him for uh, ADHD and, and different kinds of problems there. Um, so I couple, uh, it was two days later, I sent her a text and I said, it was really great. I, was, I liked what happened with the principal. She, she wrote, texted back and said, um, yeah, I, we were really happy about that too. Um, the next day we get an email, my wife gets an email from the daughter and says, we're moving to auntie's house. I say, what, what is going on here? I, so I text the mother uh, and I said, you know, are you guys okay? And she said, um, no, they were leaving the house and they were now gonna be living at auntie's house. And further, the husband had a gun and he was coming after them and I said, oh my God, what? So this is, this is all out of, out of nowhere. Um, well, it turns out in a couple of days, they disappeared. And I didn't know where they were and we couldn't find them. And it, what happened was we found out about a week later through the aunt that they had gone to a shelter. And then after that, the mother said that uh, when they got out of that, uh, she said she didn't wanna do the mentoring anymore. So I had no touch with, um, with, with Terrell and his sister. And there's, what do you do? And in a short time after that, the church closed down. So the drop-in center that we worked at, we had no connection with these kids at all. You couldn't, there was no place to go to. So I didn't know what happened. I mean, he, he had just turned 10 years old. Um, so fast forward seven and a half years, um, I'm Googling and Googling, you know, over the years, every once in a while that I, I had no other way to find out where he was. Um, and then I Googled the mugshot. Um, and it turned out that he was in serious trouble. Um, there was, well, it was a killing. Um, and so I, through a, a, a friend of mine who's a lawyer, I found out where he was. He was in the county jail here. Um, and I was able to go and get in touch with him. And I found out how to write him a letter and I wrote him a letter. And then I got this letter back. Um, and this is from the book. Usually I like to open up the letter and just read it, but I, I don't have it with me. It's in Rochester, but I do have it in the book here. He said, uh, John, wow, this is crazy, but I didn't remember you at first, but it's been so long. It's been a long time since I've seen you. And I would love to get in contact with you. I need all the support I can get. My mom and dad comes visit me once in a while, but never put money on the phone or commissary like that. The crazy thing about it is that I am here for someone else's actions, but I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Anyway, anyways, I'm all right. I try to stay focused, you know. I only got me in this world, so I just have to keep fighting and have faith in God. I know he's gonna make a way for me. I believe in him. No matter if I get five, 10 or 15, I am not giving up. It's sad that man got killed for nothing. But after I do my time, when I go upstate, if I do, I am gonna stay out of jail as long when God tell me my time is up. And you know how I'm going to do that? changed my mindset and the people that I used to hang out with. But you can come visit me when you're free. Thank you for writing me. It made me think about the good times we had. I remember we used to play table tennis and go to town walls. Them times was the best times of my childhood years. 
but I'll try to set up a visit so we can talk. Just let me know the time and day of the week. You got to reflect, oh, P.S. You got to reflect on the past, past to analyze the future, terror. Um, so I was able to get in touch with him. I did go visit. I learned about the county jail and how you get in and, and just the ins and outs of visits are just incredible. If you have someone in jail, I mean, you know, half of the times you go down there um, and if you're in poverty, you're probably taking a bus or two to get down there, then find out something's changed. Maybe the judge called him in so that you can't see him that day. Or I was in line one day when a little, it was like a grandmotherly like lady in front of me, because you go in, you leave all your stuff in a locker and then you go to the desk as they start <clears throat> telling you when you can go in to see the person that you're visiting that day. There's a woman in front of me as a grandmotherly type lady, had a little girl with her and the girl said something to her. And, and then this woman said to her, uh, no, no, mommy's going to be living here for a while. It was just, they see uh, the life is so different there, but I did get to talk to him um, and and there was one, one day when uh, we looked around, there would be maybe a hundred people at the same time talking to visitors uh, in, this, in this huge room, quite orderly. And this one day he looked at me, he said, or he looked over his shoulder and he said, two of my cousins are in here right now. So there were three of them were all in. So he was, he, he wound up with a plea deal. He's doing 15 to life now in, uh, one of the New York state prisons. I have not been able to see him yet. I've been afraid to do it with, with COVID. And uh, he, he called me for a while. Every once in a while, I'd gotta get a call and I'd have to run to the phone because if, you know, if I didn't get there in six rings, it would go off. Um, and, but now I've set it up so that I can email him and uh, we can email back and forth. Um, and now he's, he's 21 years old. Can you imagine he was 16 when this happened and he's been in jail since then. Um, 21, he's, he's actually growing up in jail. Now, how does that? So when I over here follow the little, the, uh, the little bouncing ball, a mindset that poverty can be ended, I think we've got to find a way to stop this because it just is, it, it's too painful. It is too painful and it's not right. We gotta find a way that, that, that kids like this have a chance. Um, so I would like to open this up to any questions that you have. I can also put this up here if, if you wanna use this for a frame of reference. Good, okay. Peggy, do you wanna hand, handle questions? Yeah. Yes, I will. Thank you, John, for very, thank you. What on? Oh, you're, you're coming in and out. Is that okay? Thank you, John, so I much. Yeah, okay, that was a wonderful, um, enlightening presentation on what encompasses poverty. Sure, if I, I'll check if people want to either um, unmute themselves or put it in the chat. How do you want to handle that? Do you want to? Either way. Yeah, if, if they want to. People have questions. Think, that'd be fine, yeah. Sure, if people want to put something in the chat or unmute themselves. Sure. Yeah, just, there we go. Hi, hi. Here's, okay, here's Kathy. Yeah, okay. Sure. Hi, Kathy. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Hey, hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Very, very, very interesting. I, um, I, I learned things that I thought I already knew. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful research. And, yes. uh, and, and this is, this is uh, Nancy phoning in, and I'm not sure if you can hear me, uh, but I would like to uh, put in a plug Thanks. for the Penfield uh, Rotary Club, because every Aug Aug August we, we pack 100 backpacks of school supplies. We have a liaison with an inner city school, and with 100 of backpacks with rulers, pens, crayons, paper, notebooks, whatever. And of course, education is so important. 
for all of us. But the idea of collecting these school supplies and then delivering them to an inner city school, I think is a really positive step oh, yeah. in the that's Rochester a, area. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I would suggest, yeah, keep, keep that up. I'm sure they appreciate that. Yes, are there other questions here? Nancy, any other comments or questions here? No. I'm checking the chat, John. I think they're, yeah, I don't think in the chat, but if people wanted to unmute themselves and <laughs> see if yep. anybody else. I know, I know. We were, but, I, got, I got questions, but they're not related to the book. <laughs> oh, on the topic though of um, poverty? If, no, Mike. Michael is my oldest friend. Going back. Oh, okay, okay. To when we were okay, kids. I was gonna say. Uh, actually, we uh, it might be, it might be interesting for these these guys to know too. We all went to Franklin High School. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yes. The fighting Quakers. The Quakers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember so that. I was a good graduate. <laughs> yeah, that was an area too. <laughs> it was good school though. It used to be. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Kathy was one of my very best friends. Oh, hey, this is Dottie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where is she? Pardon? Sorry, before. <laughs> there she no, is. She, she doesn't have her picture. Hi, Dottie. <laughs> we see your black screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been having trouble with my computer. Why? <laughs> See if anybody in chat here. Well, the um, just to remind people, the um, presentation is recorded, and I'm sorry there were a couple of glitches here, but we will um, be sure that everybody who is signed up um, gets um, to view it after. As I said, it mm -hmm. takes a couple of weeks, I believe, before it will be ready. But we'll send that out, or if someone wanted to, you know, uh, who missed it, I know there are a couple of people that were unable to attend at the last minute. We will send that along to them as well. All right. I can tell you if um, if you have a couple of minutes here, I could just tell you a little bit about how the book developed. Right. Um, since with, I don't know, with a library <laughs> and uh, talking to readers, um, what happened was I was doing these presentations for a while. Um, and then I realized I, I wanted to write some things down so that people could walk away with uh, something after a presentation. Uh, and then eventually I, I wrote a whole bunch of essays and realized nobody's gonna read this that way. Uh, and then I started to organize the book in a, in a different way as it, as it finally came, down, came, came out. Uh, it was difficult to do because I had stories and also science and this long list and how do you get all this stuff together? Um, but I did, it took me probably about five years to put it all together. Uh, and then I started looking for, uh, once you get it written, you get readers. You try to get readers. My sister Joyce, who was on tonight, read it. Uh, sister Janet Korn read it. Uh, Kathy read the book. And Mike, I, Mike read the book. It was just, that's where you get your information about, well, wait a minute, this, about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and then you get this book, manuscript on your hand and now what do you do with it? And I started going after um, uh, small publishers. And so I started uh, submitting simultaneously. I told them I was submitting simultaneously. And I set out probably uh, a, a letter, a query letter, and then a couple of, maybe a chapter uh, I don't know, I think I just sent out a query letter to about 30 or 40 or maybe 50 uh, and le uh, editors. And I started getting a couple that were interesting, you know, a couple that were saying we're a small house, we can't do this, but I think somebody should. And that was encouraging. And then finally I got uh, uh, the, uh, the company that I went with here. Um, Yep. This is Word and Deed, which mm -hmm. is a Canadian publishing company, and uh, and then he responded and was interested, and and then that was that. So I wound up. I had a choice at the beginning too. Do I just write this and try to self-publish, 
I knew I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get this in front of an editor. Uh, I've done some writing before, you know, newspaper. I've done some work with the, the DNC and, uh, and I've written some other books and small books and, and some work for children uh, from a, a publishing company that my daughter works with. Um, but I knew that I needed an editor to look at this and go through it with me. So there was a copy editor that did that. It was really helpful. In fact, there was one section here where we quibbled about something that uh, was right here where I'm pointing out EF, executive functions. Uh, your executive functions are your planning, memory, flexibility, planning, flexibility, emotion, impulsivity. These are all parts of your executive function. He said, well, wait a minute, these are that. You can't have, you know, that, that's one. That's just one impact. And I said, no, you could have this and, and not that, or you could have this. So we quibbled about that. He finally let me keep it in. Plus they kept my 90 here. I didn't know what I was going to do if I had a rewrite. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I actually, with the 90 uh, impacts that I had here, I actually uh, did uh, delete a few along the way. And then something would come up that made me realize, no, wait a minute, this belongs here. Uh, and it just kept being what it was. So I, th I think I'm, I'm in the ballpark anyway. What I personally believe it adds up to is... Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a disease. Poverty is almost <laughs> like a disease. Uh, you can think yeah. of it that way. Once you're in it, it's tough, right. it's tough to get yourself straightened out. Um, John, we do have one question in the chat right now. Are you, currently in, uh, are you currently involved in programs to deal with poverty? In the second part of the question, what avenues do you think are being most effective? Um, I, I, my... Uh, what I do is present. Um, this, this is my, I think this is my 115th presentation wow. that I've done. So I, I go around, I think I'm just trying to get word out that way. Uh, I also would like to, uh, and will do this at some point, um, COVID really killed this part of it. I, I want to go back to uh, Action for a Better Community uh, and do some uh, um, volunteer work there working with kids and, young, and adults trying to get their GED uh, and, and just do some tutorial work uh, in that way. Uh, about, I know at ABC, Action for a Better Community, about 43% of the people there did not even have a GED. I mean, you've, where, so that has to be helped. And that's, the, that's uh, what I do. Um, and that's the area that I'm in right now. Uh, my wife and I are also involved in, in some other things. My wife is quite involved with, uh, and my, I'm planning another book. I'm about probably about 70 or 80 pages into a book that I plan to write uh, that has to do with uh, racism. Uh, be looking at it in, from my own point of view too, and my own dealing with it and coming to try to understand it. Um, and if, whether that comes to something, we'll see. Uh, I don't know if it will or not, um, but I'm gonna to try to make it do that. Um, <clears throat> and we do have copies of the book, but they're not in right now, I don't think at any of the libraries. So some of you may have them at home reading them, but um, okay, you can always okay. put a hold on as well. I don't know, John, do you ever do um, like signing sessions at all for? The book you probably did in the beginning, I maybe. Do but. yeah, I'll do any you know book clubs yeah. or. Okay. Yes, I would be glad to do it anytime. <clears throat> but I have I have done several book clubs. They really they've turned out to be a lot of fun to do, oh. uh, and it's I uh, now that COVID you know, now we'll see if it's going to go away. I'm I'm not sure I like uh, some of the signs of what's happening as we get closer to all being indoors again. Um, but it, it's really neat to do with these things live. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more interesting. But by Zoom now, I can talk to my friends in California too. And uh, <laughs> Matt and Nancy from, uh, from uh, Chautauqua are able to, <laughs> to check in too. And Dottie, it's, it's so good to, to run into you folks again. Matt, um, I think I mentioned. So this, 
So I, I, I do plan to stay involved with this and do, you know, do what I can. Mostly it's going to be with mentoring and tutoring and presenting like this and keeping up to date. I, I do update every one of these that I do. I've updated every uh, presentation that I've given. Uh, they all, I learn something each time and then learn what's not working each time too. And, uh, and I'm glad we all made it through this. Uh, I, I'm glad we made it through the technological parts here. Yeah. You know, I appreciate your patience with that too, because I know it's, uh, it's, it's hard enough looking at a lot of science like this and staying with it. And unless you can, I don't know, be able to see it. So we're hoping to have in-person programs after Labor Day at the library, if all goes well. But we also are hoping to have um, the programs recorded. So if people prefer to get it, um, do a recorded version rather than to come out. So we're working on that um, possibility too. So thank you, John. Yeah. Great friend. Yeah, and that was wonderful. It was I don't yeah, think there's any you. more in the chat. I just want to check and and um, you know, we'll hope right. maybe John, we can have you back in person and you'll be working on another book and we'll see if we can um, get more. And uh, yeah. again, people are thanking um, you for your compassionate presentation. We've got some wonderful comments. So thank you again, everyone. Well, I'm, thank I'm you, grateful to all of you. And thank, thank you, you for this opportunity. Smiling face. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. And we will watch for the recording, folks.